In section 2.6, we look at transformations of functions. What we're going to talk about here specifically is how do you take a known graph of a function and shift it horizontally or vertically or stretch it or reflect it across one of the axes. So we'll go ahead and start with vertical shifts. And for this, we will assume that c is a positive number. So if you know what the graph of f of x looks like, the graph of f of x plus c is just going to shift the graph vertically up c units. And f of x minus c will shift the graph down c units. So to illustrate this, suppose we have the function f of x is equal to x squared. And what I'd like to do is graph the function g of x is equal to x squared plus 2. x squared plus 2 is going to be the same graph as x squared, but shifted up 2 units. So every point on the graph of x squared is going to shift up 2 units. So the point at 0, 0 moves up to 0, 2. The point here at 1, 1 moves up 2 to the point 1, 3. Likewise on the other side here. And we can do this with every point on the curve. And what you get is a vertical translation of that graph. Now likewise, if I was graphing, say, h of x is equal to x squared minus 3, this is going to be a vertical translation of the graph downward three units. So the point here at the origin will shift down to zero, negative three, and correspondingly, the rest of the points will shift down three units as well. Now what's important to realize here is that all three of these graphs have the exact same shape. They've just been shifted vertically, either up or down, by the specified amount. Horizontal shifts of graph pretty much works the same way. So if you have the graph of some known function f of x, the function f of x minus c will actually shift it to the right c units, and f of x plus c will shift it to the left c units. So to illustrate this, once again, we have our basic function f of x is equal to x squared. And we would like to know what does g of x equal x plus 1 quantity squared look like? So first of all, the difference between vertical and horizontal translations is for the vertical translations, the addition or subtraction happens outside of the original function. Whereas for the horizontal transformation, the addition or subtraction is, hand, is happening within the function. So x plus 1 to the second power, we're looking at this situation here. That's going to shift the graph to the left one unit. So every point on the curve gets shifted to the left one unit. So the origin gets shifted to the left. This point here gets shifted to the left. This point shifted to the left. All points get shifted to the left exactly one unit. And once again, that graph has the exact same shape as the original graph, but it's just been shifted. Likewise, if I was graphing, say, h of x is equal to x minus 5 to the second power, this is going to shift the graph five units, but now to the right. So the origin at 0, 0 gets shifted all the way over to 5, 0, and the rest of the points on the original function get shifted five units to the right as well. And again, all three of these graphs have the same shape. We're just shifting it to the left or the right, the prescribed number of units. So basically, the importance of this topic is that if you know the graph of a function, 
you can easily graph a variation of that function if you know how these transformations work. The next concept we're going to look at is reflecting graphs. So once again, assume that you know the graph of some function f of x. If you want to graph negative f of x, that is just going to be a reflection of the graph of f of x, but over the x-axis. So if this is what f of x looks like, negative f of x gets shifted across the x-axis and will be a mirror image of f of x on the other side. And if you do f of negative x, this will be a reflection across the y-axis. So if your function looks like this, f of negative x is just going to reflect it across the y-axis so that you will have a mirror image over here. So for example, if we once again look at the function f of x is equal to x squared, the graph of g of x equals negative x squared will just take every point on this graph and will reflect it over the x-axis. So the point zero, 0, stays at zero, 0, but this point here will reflect across the x-axis to this point. This point here at 2, 4 will reflect across to 2, negative 4, and so we'll get this kind of a graph here. And same thing happens on the other side. These points reflect over, and that is what negative x squared would look like. Now, to illustrate a reflection across the y-axis, let's consider a, a different function. And the function that we have right here is f of x is equal to x cubed. And so if I wanted to look at, say, g of x is equal to negative x quantity cubed, this would reflect the graph across the y-axis. So the point at 0, 0 stays where it is, but the point here at 1, 1 would reflect across over to here, which would be negative 1, 1. And all those points would reflect across to a mirror image. So that graph would look like this. And then likewise, these points down here would reflect across to the other side. And so this is what the graph of negative x quantity cubed would look like. So you can reflect across the x-axis or you can reflect across the y-axis. One more thing to consider is stretching and shrinking of graphs. And so again, if you have a known graph of f of x, if you multiply that f of x by a number c that is greater than 1, that is going to stretch the graph by a factor of c. And if you multiply by a number c that is between 0 and 1, that is going to shrink the graph by that factor. So, for example, if we have our function f of x here, which has this graph, if I wanted to know what 2 times f of x would look like, that is going to stretch the graph vertically by a factor of 2. So basically every point is going to get twice as tall. So of course the origin point stays where it is. But this point here, which has you know, a height of 1, is now going to have a height of 2. Any point on the x-axis stays on the x-axis. This point here, which has a height of negative 1, is going to now have a height of negative 2. And so it gets stretched by a factor of 2. It looks something like this. Now, likewise, if I was graphing, say, 1 half times f of x, what that would do is it would just make all the points half as tall as they were. So this point here, instead of being up at 1, it would only go up to 1 half. This point here, instead of being down at negative 1, would only go to negative 1 half. And again, the points on the x-axis would stay where they are. And this one would look like this. 
So we can stretch or shrink the graph vertically. And what determines whether it's a stretching or a shrinking is, once again, if C is greater than 1, it's a stretch. If C is less than 1, it's a shrink. Now we can also do the same thing horizontally. But horizontally shrinking or stretching a graph is a little bit counterintuitive. So if you want to know what f of c times x will do, if c is greater than 1, it's actually going to shrink. And if c is less than 1, it's going to stretch. So for example, if I have this graph f of x here, and I want to know what does f of 2 times x look like. This is going to shrink by a factor of 1 over c, which in this case is 1 over 2. So what that means is that every point in the x direction is going to shrink by 1 half. So here where x is 1, it's now going to shrink down this way to x equals 1 half. Where x equals 2, it's going to shrink down to x equals 1, etc., etc. And so what happens is you get this kind of an effect on the graph. And for those of you who have taken trigonometry, you might recognize that this looks like a trigonometric graph. Now what happens if I do something like f of 1 half? times x. Well, if the number c is less than 1, it's going to stretch it by a factor of 1 over c. So this is going to be a stretch by 1 over 1 half, which is equal to 2. So what that does is it makes the x values twice as big as what they used to be. So the point at the origin doesn't change. But the point right here moves out to twice its size. The point here moves out to twice its size. In other words, it gets stretched this way. And I will admit at first, when you're doing stretching and shrinking, especially horizontally, it can be a little bit confusing. But with practice, you get better at it. Let's put some of these concepts together. So here we have an example where our original function is f of x equals x squared. And I would like to graph the function g of x, which is 5 minus 2 times x plus 1 to the second power. Now, first thing I want to do is I'm going to rewrite g of x just a little bit. I'm going to write it as negative 2 times x plus 1 squared and then plus 5. So we have a few things going on here. And I'm going to do them in order. You always start with the variable x. And the first thing that happens to it is you add 1 to that x. And that is going to shift the graph left one unit. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. So if I just want to take care of that, I'm going to shift the graph to the left one unit. And when we shift it to the left one unit, we get this graph. Now the next thing that happens is that value, after you square it, gets multiplied by negative 2. Now the negative 2 does two things. One is it reflects over the x-axis, because we are multiplying by a negative, and it also stretches the graph by a factor of 2. So it's going to reflect it over the x-axis. So all of these points here are going to be reflected down here. But they are also going to be stretched by a factor of 2. So for example, this point right here will be reflected over the x-axis to here. But then it also gets doubled. So instead of being at negative 1, it's going to be at negative 2. Same thing happens with this point. This point stays where it is. 
And then this point, instead of being up here at positive 4, it's going to be shifted over to negative 4 and then doubled to negative 8. So it's going to be somewhere way down here. And so that is what this graph looks like. Okay, so I took all those points on the blue graph there, and I reflected it over the x-axis and also made them twice as tall in that direction. Now what I want to do is take care of the last part of this, which is the plus 5. The plus 5 simply moves the graph up 5 units. So all this other stuff here has already happened. That's this graph here. Now we're going to take that graph and we're going to shift it up 5 units. So this point gets shifted up 5 units to here. This point gets shifted up 5 units to here, etc., etc. And when it's all said and done, this is the graph that we get from that. And we'll erase the in-between step. And this here is the final graph for the function g of x. So notice that I did that in a sequence of steps, right? I didn't just apply all of those things at once. I carefully did it one step at a time. The last concept we want to consider is the concept of an even and an odd function. An even function is a function in which f of negative x is equal to f of positive x. So that is to say, whatever the function value is at a particular value of x, you get the same function value at f of negative x. So what happens when you have an even function, algebraically this is true. But graphically what it means is you have symmetry across the y-axis. And we say a function is odd if f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. And what that means is that whatever value you get for x, you are going to get the opposite of that value at negative x. And this gives you a symmetry that goes through the origin. So we want to be able to identify when we have an even function and when we have an odd function. Now, you can test for that, and the test is quite simple. In either case, when you're testing for an even function or an odd function, you need to consider what is f of negative x. So the question here is, are the functions f of x and g of x even, odd, or neither? So to answer this question, I need to do f of negative x. And to do that, I'm just going to replace the x with negative x. And then we're going to simplify. Now, negative x to the fourth power is x to the fourth power. Because when you raise a negative to an even number, the negative goes away. Same thing happens when you square a negative x. So negative x quantity squared is the same as x squared. So this becomes negative 5 x squared. And then plus 4 stays the same. And you should notice that this is exactly the same as what you started with. So in this case, we have f of negative x is equal to f of x. And in that case, we say the function is even. Now we're going to do the same thing for g of x. Is g of x even or odd or neither? Well, let's consider what does g of negative x equal? And once again, it just means we're going to replace x with negative x. But this time, notice that you have 4 times negative x, which is negative 4x. And then you have a minus. And then we have negative x to the third power. Well, when you cube a negative, the negative stays there. It does not go away. So negative x quantity to the third power is the same as negative x to the third power.
So what you end up getting here is negative 4x plus x cubed. And if you factor out a negative here, you get negative 4x minus x cubed. And you should notice that 4x minus x cubed is the function that we started with. And so this is equal to negative g of x, which means this function is odd. And it is true that the moniker, right, the name for these, has very much to do with the powers involved. So you might notice in f of x, it only has even powers of x, and that is partially why it's an even function. And g of x only has odd powers of x, right? Because this is a first power here. And that is kind of where the name odd comes from. But you have to be kind of careful. You can't just look at the powers of x and always determine whether it's even or odd. You have to be a little bit more careful than that. All right. So that's it for this one.